Everything's gonna be alright And when we get there I'ma see a pretty, pretty, pretty young thing I'ma ask her to take my hand Head to the floor And we gon' dance And when we get there Best believe we're gonna do a two-step Ain't no drama in here So don't stress Step to the right Then side to the left Welcome to the Stephen Knight Show. Hope you're having a great Monday. We're so glad to have you back with us tonight. Uh, we welcome a very talented singer-songwriter who was once a background singer for Erykah Badu, but has gone on to become a Grammy Award-nominated artist. Her name is Nadami. She has a brand-new EP called Air Castle. You definitely want to check that out. And then later on, uh, filmmaker Ralph A. Celestin and Best Actress winner Mia Mendez uh, they joined us to discuss their new critically acclaimed film, Boston to Philly, which has already won several awards uh, at various uh, film festivals around the world. Now, of course, we're bringing the, the latest in movie reviews, sports, fashion, and the best indie, indie music out there. Now, on Hot Topics, we're talking about the whole uh, Drake and Pusha T beef. We're talking about um, Bill Clinton says that he doesn't owe... Monica Lewinsky a personal uh, apology because he did a public apology to her and her family 20 years ago. Then we talk about the whole Roseanne uh, saga. Should there be a re uh, uh, spinoff or shouldn't there be? All that and much more in Hot Topics. I want to remind you all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, and of course our official website, thestevenisshow.com. You can also check us out on Google Play, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, <laughs> just go to our website, the com. When we come back, Hot Topics, right back after this. Uh, uh, when on the beat, it's too flexing. If you taste my banana, you not go home. If you taste my banana, you not go home. My baby banana, baby, you not go home. My baby banana, baby, you not go home.
taste my banana, you not go If you taste my banana, you not go My baby banana, baby, you not go My baby banana, baby, you not go On the beat is too flexing. We're all alone. Nobody knows. It's a little secret. That's how we should keep it. Baby, we've been creeping on the low. No time to waste. It's getting late. Get your off the deep end. We're supposed to be here. But it feels. This is Ndombi, and you are listening to the Stephen Stephen Knight Show. Is that right? Correct, yeah. Stephen Knight Show. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me start over. Okay. This is Ndombi, and you are listening to the Stephen Knight Show. That's one. Welcome back to the Stephen Knight Show. Ms. Parker, how's it going? Happy Monday. How are you? I'm doing well. I can't complain. You just got back from a big trip. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, I was in Cuba. I went to Cuba for about a week with 17 people. Wow. Which I knew. Um, and the other 15 I didn't didn't know before the trip. But it was a great experience. Um, you know, it was people of all class, economic background, race, um, age. Mm-hmm. Um, just a really, really great group of, uh, we call ourselves the United Nations. <laughs> it was um it was a great experience and then obviously being in Cuba was a, an amazing experience kind of taking yourself back in time no internet access yeah um, it, it, it kind of rained a lot just because that week was a big hurricane week in the tri- in the uh, Caribbean and so 
everywhere kind of got a lot of rain, but we made, mm-hmm. you know, we made the best of it and, and, and had a good time anyway. So, no, it was a good experience. Only an hour and 45-minute flight. Oh, really? And, yeah, but it seems like it's such a far distance location just because we haven't been permitted to go there for, for a time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I saw the picture. He's looking good in that, too, in that uh, bikini. <laughs> yeah, I've been working on it. I've been working on it. <laughs> Are you back now? <laughs> well, that's good. I saw the pictures. Um, they look really good. So I'm glad you had a good time, made it safe, you know, and sound and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's going on with you, TK? Hello, hello. What's going on? Not much. How was your weekend? Weekend was pretty good. Cannot complain. <laughs> um, a, couple, a friend of mine is uh, actually moving out of state, so we had a going away party for her. Okay. Uh, starting off a uh, new uh, venture in life. And, um, yeah, and I'm pr- plotting my, my um, I guess it's a press tour, I guess, for um, Mercy, the movie that's – Oh, yeah. We made mm-hmm. on Amazon. So we're now starting to do press to help promote it on um, Amazon, which is pretty exciting because that's the part that's that I really love, to go around yeah. and talking to people. Yeah. Oh, congratulations again on that and, uh, you know, continued success with that project. It's definitely got wings and it's taken off. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I was supposed to perform Saturday and it did not happen. I got dressed up and everything. Um, I get, got there. Your pictures. Yeah. So, you know, I was asked to perform at this single release party. It was um, Cell Phone Man, Friday Cell Phone Man. It was a new single, Banana, which is a hot song. And so um, I think I saw the flyer. The flyer said doors open at 8. And so I assumed it would start about 9, 30, 10. And I get there at 8, and I'm waiting and waiting. I don't even see anyone that asked me to perform. <laughs> I don't see any artists. I don't even see uh, Friday Cell Phone Man. And it's like I'm just sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. Uh, my best friend was with me. And then I text uh, the person who asked me to perform, I said, what time, is, this is about 9.30, what time does it start? Now. That's the text I get back. <laughs> I'm looking around. How? So uh, I said, well, are you here? Which I knew she wasn't because I could see everybody in there. And it was a nice spot, don't get me wrong. And um, and she said, I'm almost there. And so I just let her know that I actually had something else to attend, you know, later that night, so I'd need to leave by 10. And so I wasn't able to perform, but um, – for what I saw, he, the, uh, someone came up to me that worked the event, and he said that um, he said they <laughs> they work on African time, so it was like you know I how they also. Uh, that's, what he, that's what he said. He said. Don't do that. Yeah. He, yeah. He yeah, said. He, he said. He said we anticipate to start at ten thirty or eleven. Oh my God! That'll be eight o'clock. <laughs> And so I mean, it was, and he was like, you know, our bad. We should have communicated better. We should have explained that to you. You know, it, it was it was all good. And you know, and I, you know, I liked them all a lot. And I wished uh, them the best with the single because it's a really hot song. We'll play it later on the show. But yeah, I didn't get to perform, and I was ready too. Voice was right. I know. <laughs> yeah. You ready for the next one? I ready for the next one. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that was my weekend. But I still had a good weekend regardless. Well, our question of the day is. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um, probably a way of creating peace. Hmm. We need that. Or peace. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Chica? I think I'll start with that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mine, mine would be the power of persuasion because I would use it for that purpose, which Ms. Parker mentioned. I've hmm. always, since a kid, I always wish I had power of persuasion. You know, I think I I kind of struggle with this one because I, I always wish I could fly, which I don't think what I what I do with that. But also, I know back when um, I was a kid, remember Back to the Future, I had to go back in the in the future like decades ago. I used to wish I could do that, I'd go like in a time machine and go backwards. So I, so maybe that'd be something I because I always I always wanted to see how my parents grew up, like especially like high school, college, like see those days. So to me, I'm so fascinated with that the seventies. And I would, I, you know, I just want to see it. But then I think about, like, Ms. Parker, you're in Cuba, no internet, no, no, uh, no technology like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, uh, wasn't, it wasn't a 
wasn't a big deal for me at all. I, That's good. Usually when I, I travel, I'm not on my phone that much anyway. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It wasn't big. I'm not one of those people who go around hunting for internet. I'm, I've never been that person. Yeah, because you uh, said they they, 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 they got to mm-hmm. search for internet. <laughs> yeah. I remember you telling me there were places you could go, but it wasn't really convenient. It was expensive. It was like, it's not that serious. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they have hot spots. So even the people who live there, there are parks that you, they can go to and, and purchase internet by hour. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's anywhere between six to twenty dollars, depending on how long you want to stay there and then you know where you are. Um, but no, it's not because of um, because Cuba was was separated from the rest of really society for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as you know, internet service and things like that is not it's not it's not as available as as it would be here. Um, right. I think, the phone, I think the, even their phone service is a, is a bit shaky. So. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, if you want to go above and beyond, you can find it, but it's not, it's not really reliable and it's just not convenient. So for me, it just wasn't a big deal. Like I said, I'm not the person who has to be on my internet. I wasn't on it the whole, you know, six days that we were there, didn't buy right. it. Um, I had my iPad, downloaded some movies. So during the days when it rained pretty bad and, uh, we, you know, didn't really do much, lay around, watch movies. Um, that was, that was, you know, okay for me as well, but. You know, overall, the experience was great, and, and um, I think because I'm used to traveling um, in different places, internet is not always a good Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yep. And then also, uh, it's not it's not something that um, that you need all the time anyway. So. Yeah. I think it would be cool to get a break from all that, you know what I mean? Uh, especially on a trip or something like that. So. Exactly. I was just thinking, I hope that it stays that way. Because it's it's kind of I mean at this in this stage in life it's a novel idea to it have a space that is right. retro. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, you you were thinking this, but you should have seen people going. I mean, going out in their minds to find. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'd They're be so me. addicted to it. They're so addicted to it. Uh, I know, I know. Yeah, well, I think gotta be you too. I think it would be me. Welcome for some. <laughs> Well, tweet us at Stephen Knight Show SHO and let us know uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? All right, Hot Topics. So we weren't, we weren't on last week um, live, and so we didn't get to talk about the whole Roseanne situation. So quick, uh, for those living on the rock that probably haven't heard, Roseanne tweeted, uh, made a racist tweet um, towards Valerie Jarrett, who worked for um, President Barack Obama, an outstanding woman, upstanding woman. And uh, she pretty much compared it to a ape. Well, right away, ABC can't within hours they had canceled her show. But you know they did a reboot of Roseanne the show, and it was it, it was the highest uh, rating sh- uh, show in prime time. You know, in time it aired, I think on Tuesdays. And so they um, they canceled the show. A lot of the uh, actors, you know, the stars on the show, they tweeted, you know just against Roseanne, they couldn't understand, you know, they were very disappointed, and especially because they, they said that their purpose of creating the show was to show different perspectives of Democrats, um, Republicans, Trump supporters, you know, just different uh, sides, even brought in black castmates and all that, whatever. So um, Roseanne, she said she apologized for the tweet, and then she said she was removing herself off Twitter, which she did not do. She just kept tweeting. And then, like, when a castmate tweeted something, she, you know, would respond. Like she said to Sarah Gilbert, really, I created this platform uh, for you, and this is how you do slap me in the face. And it was just all this crazy stuff. It's kind of like what we see in Trump when he tweets all the time. It's kind of just all over the place. Well, her ex-husband, Tom Arnold, he's been um, on CNN, and then this morning he was on Good Morning Britain. And he says that his ex-wife, well, on CNN last week, he said that when he first met Roseanne, she was not like that. They, he said they both struggled from mental illness, and she got better first. She helped him get better. He said she was a feminist. She was about inclusion and all that. And he said after, you know, he, hadn't, he hadn't really been around her in 20-some years since so they divorced, but he said that um, he noticed within the last, you know, as years gone on, that she had started with all these crazy uh, conspiracy theories and racist comments. And he said that he always kept in touch with her children because he considered them his stepchildren, though know, they were divorced. And they, and they told him that they would, like, if she would make a crazy tweet, they'd go in right away and try to delete it. And they were trying to help her, you know, keep her image up. But, you know, apparently she wasn't good at that. Well, this morning he said that, um, that she is undoubtedly a racist, 
And um, he said he acknowledges the plague is plagued by she's plagued by mental illness. He said that um, when they asked him about the tweet, when Pierce Morgan asked him about the tweet that taped the show, he says that Roseanne has been off the rails for the last six months, so he's not surprised. He says that Roseanne suffers from mental illness, multiple personality disorder, but does not excuse what she said. He said uh, she's she does, he said she does take meds, but Ambien isn't one of them. She tried to the next day after she made the tweet. She said that she was on Ambien when she made the tweet. Of course, Ambien came out and said there are some risk factors, but racism isn't one of them. Um, and then on the subject of Donald Trump, she said that she ha- he has no question that um, Trump is a racist um, and he's fuel- fueling racism. He said that when he was filming Celebrity Apprentice, he heard Trump make race- racist comments. Um, you know, during the filming. So what are your thoughts on, uh, well, let me ask this question, because some people were saying, you know, they felt really bad for the rest of the cast and the crew, hundreds of people lost their jobs because of one person. So they were thinking about doing a reboot of the show um, without her and making maybe like Jackie, her sister, the star or something to that nature. What are your thoughts on, do you think it, they should do a reboot of the Roseanne show without her? Or not a re- reboot, a, a spinoff without Roseanne? So I didn't um, find out until I, I got back. I, I don't know what's going on until I got back from Cuba, but I remember when we landed and, um, you know, obviously everybody's phone started going off and, right. and, and no one had the access for a few days. And um, to me, it was a, it was a, um, for me, it was a, it was a good news, like a good welcome back news. Because I've always, well, I remember when the show first uh, got rebooted. I told you, I said you were. You, I think you had mentioned, you know, that the show was pretty. You, you thought the show was pretty good because it showed both sides, and you were right. annoyed mm-hmm. the fact that it showed both sides. And I was like, well, I'm not going to watch her because I think she's a racist. Right. Um. And and I've always felt that way. And, and I'm and, and and I guess because I've always been a news junkie, I've always seen her interviews. Even when I was a kid, she never she never seemed like she was comfortable in the presence of black people. She always, she always, her jokes were always somehow offensive to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but when, um, when she did interviews after the show was rebooted, I felt even more uh, offended by her because she was saying that the reason her show is so good is because it's showing the. T- and then she also mentioned that she voted for Trump, but she also said that she Trump represented people like her who've never had a voice in America, or who felt voiceless in America. Now, mm-hmm. how can you be a white people in America and feel voiceless when you have had an enslaved well, for 400 years? People were enslaved, and you've been and and <laughs> white America have no right to say that they've been unheard or doesn't have a voice. And so, for me, it's that was disturbing um, because I think that you're then you're you're discounting people who really don't have a voice. Yeah, you can say as a woman, I felt like my voice had been minimized. Um, there are things you can say, but I think a lot of times when white Americans speak, especially Trump supporters, they speak from a self-centered, selfish place where they completely discount the people who are really suffering and, and, and experience discrimination in this country. And so mm-hmm. that bothers me. So I've never been a fan of her or the show, so I was happy to hear that it was canceled. Hmm. How about you, Chica? Um. I was disappointed because I was a fan of the show. Uh, I have been a fan of Roseanne um, almost forever. Um, she's she's a weird situation as far as that is concerned because she wasn't always Roseanne, quote unquote. Um, she was her own proclamation, poor white trash, who acquired fame, who acquired riches um, through her talent. So she kind of lived both sides of the spectrum. Um, it was just, I, I don't know. I've heard stories of her and her private life being, um, I don't want to say the word, I don't like the word racist, because I think that everyone is racist. If you have pride in the race that you are, then you're automatically a racist. I'm going to use bigot, because race, being a racist and being a bigot are two different things. Um, her being bigoted, I didn't know that it was to that degree. Um, I've heard stories, but um, people that are in her circle or in the surroundings who have probably worked with her probably know best or better, and um, I feel as if you're going to get into the den with snakes, then you probably need to watch out for the fallout, 
And at some point, the people that were working with her had to know that it was a ticking time bomb. So I kind of sort of don't feel bad, but the good thing about contracts is you're contracted with the network. The network will probably do you right either financially or they will give you a show to recoup monies that they spent. So hopefully they will get that spinoff and they will continue on. But as far as Roseanne is concerned, you made your bed, now you have to lie in it. Well, you know, Wendy Williams made a great point um, last week about a spinoff, which I didn't think about. And she said that, you know, because Roseanne was the creator behind the show, if they do do a spinoff, she's going to re- recoup money from that. And she said, whole, thought the whole point was for her to learn from this and her, us not pay her, or ABC not pay her, which I didn't think about that. So in a sense, you know, Sarah, Gil- uh, Sarah Gilbert was on The View, I mean, on uh, the talk that showed, uh, which they were actually out last week. And she said that, um, you know, it was a difficult week for her um, because she's the one that got them all to do, to do the reboot. She's the one that initiated everything. And she said it was a difficult week for her because they tried so hard to make the show inclusive and um, show represent different sides and not uh, let everyone have a voice. And that, you know, the fact that Roseanne uh, made these statements and got the show canceled, she said that she feels like, um, she stands behind what she said when she tweeted that she um, was disappointed in Roseanne, and she said she stands behind the fact that ABC canceled the show. She said even though it, it cost a lot of people their jobs, I stand beside it because this shouldn't be tolerated. So uh, cool and, they, and they ABC the, for doing it. Mm-hmm. Even on the second time around, um, Roseanne is executive producer because she created the platform of the Roseanne show. Right. Right. However. The second time around, it was Sarah Gilbert who was boss lady because she yeah. is the one that put this back together. So the power is in her hands now, I guess, to, as to if, what she wants to do with this now platform of a show. Um, the only thing that they would probably have to give Roseanne royalties are if they use anything from the first show that was of her creation because we don't know if she created those characters as well. We definitely know that Roseanne was created by her, but I don't know about those characters and if mm-hmm. she would even get executive producer billing. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll be watching. All right, so uh, Janet Jackson had to call the police to um, check on the wel- welfare of her one-year-old son, Issa, over the weekend. So apparently uh, the housekeeper, I mean the uh, nanny that was watching her son at her ex-husband's house um, – she became alarmed by her ex-husband's behavior and apparently went in the bathroom, locked the door, and called Janet and said that she was concerned. Janet then called the police and said that, um, you know, the one to go check on the son, she feels that she thought that he might be doing drugs in front of the son. The police got there and there was nothing, nothing found. But to me, what it made it seem like that Janet knows that he does do drugs because if you're going to assume someone does drugs, you know what I mean? If you're married to him for that year, that long, uh, you must, you might already know that there's drug use, um, but she wants sole custody of of the son. What are your thoughts on this? Janet knows how to pick them, don't she? <laughs> it, it seems like all her men <laughs> have that kind of issue. Mm. And I, I don't know. She has a type, and um, it, it's starting to be more apparent now, not just the money part, but why she actually got divorced. Mm. And I remember her saying when she um, – divorced her, the husband that she had the longest, I think his name was Renee, because he was a drug addict, and so was um, James Barge, a drug addict. And um, she said that she would never deal with that again, but she constantly gets into these relationships with these men that have these substance abuse issues. Um, All I can do is pray for everyone. I hope that she does gain soul custody if this is the case. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, Ms. Parker? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, it seems like that's a family domestic issue. I'm hoping that for the baby's sake that everything works out because, you know, a child is involved, and, you know, especially at that age, um, you know, it's important that he does eventually have both parents in his life actively. So I'm hoping that they can work it out and, and whoever has the issue on, on either side or both sides can get that worked out. Yeah, I, I agree. Totally agree. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of a Colorado baker who refused a wedding cake excuse me, for a same-sex couple. The court ruled that the laws and the Constitution can, and in some cases, uh, must protect gay people and couples 
and exercising their civil rights, but religious and a philosophical objection, objections uh, to gay marriage are protected views in some instances, the court ruled. Now, the court said that the Colorado, Colorado Civil Rights Commission had shown hostility towards the baker based, on purely, based purely on his uh, religious beliefs. The ruling wasn't even close. Seven to nine justices uh, sided with the baker. Uh, Justice Kennedy criticized a member of the public who lashed out at the baker during the hearing in Colorado. Kennedy pointed that to what he said were comments that called the baker religious views as de- despicable and comparing his views to slavery and Holocaust. Now, the baker also re- he um, appeared on The View earlier this year, and he said that he didn't judge the gay um, couple. He said he would have made them a cake as long it just wasn't marriage because he didn't, for his religious beliefs, he didn't believe that, um, you know, he didn't believe in gay marriage, so that's why he wouldn't make that cake, but he would have sold them any other cake they wanted. Um, and they said that this, you know, this is not something that's in stone. So, like, if, a, if it happens again with another couple, it can always go back before the Supreme Court. What are your thoughts? Um, I just think also it was, you know, me understanding and reading about it and, and, and reading about the law that pertains to that. It just seemed like it's a, it's a shaky, um, shaky yeah, ground to rule it is. that gentleman had the, the artistic right. So that could be, like Joy said on the, the view, that could be um, then used for anything. Like a chef can say, well, this is my artistic right but not to see these people. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. It, just, it seems confusing and backwards because this was, this was the same court and the same judge that wrote the um, the judgment ruling for gay marriages. So I don't know. If yeah, that yeah. Just, but God, it's just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And and um, my thing is, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want anybody to bake my cake who doesn't want to bake my cake. So right. I Man. wouldn't. I wouldn't. You know, I mean, I think that should be more of a common sense thing. Okay, because we. We, for example, as black people, we go places where we feel unwanted, and we have to make decisions to go to other places. So, you know, I think just like anything else, when you're not the majority, um, you're going to have to make decisions personally that these people are not going to get your money. The way you really affect people is by it's economics anyways. Mm-hmm. So your power is within your money, your dollars. So I don't know if it, it should have went that far, but the ruling just seems confusing to me. It is confusing. What do you say, Chica? A real superficial, basic level. When I'm in a restaurant and I have issues with the food and I have to send it back, I'm not eating there. So I'll be darned if I'm going to have issues with you over you creating something for me to ingest and we have issues over that. And then suppose the court did, you know, rule in my favor and forced you to make me a cake. I'm not going to eat it. Like, I'm, I don't want anything from you. You took the stance that you didn't want to serve me. You took the stance that you didn't want to, um, that it was against your your beliefs or your values. I'm not going to force you to do it. I can go elsewhere. You know, Mm -hmm. you you weren't the only baker. You are not the only person. You're not the only proprietor. There's other people out here. It's not going to be that big of a deal to me. That's what that's what I thought. I thought you know, just go to someone else. (laughs) There are plenty of uh, places that would you know, I guess would do it. Um, But that's it's 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 a Slippery slope because, you know, someone's uh, religious convictions and beliefs, you know, that's their right to have, Um, you know. So it's it's just an interesting, like Ms. Parker said, it's an interesting case. But, again, I say go to another place, and hopefully that won't be a problem. All right, let's take a quick commercial break, and we have – we're going to talk about Bill Clinton and Monica Whiskey in 2018 and then uh, talk about Drake versus Pusha T. Right back after this.
living this way. That's why I'm packing my suitcase. I'm only taking what I need. The world is waiting for me. I won't sit home any longer. Such a job in the hunger. And I should be making a difference. I know I'm telling the truth. Wasted potential is the death of me. In this planet of dead men who live. Cause the world. To my suitcase, I'm gonna make a difference. Not gonna walk in ignorance, make the world listen. I'ma leave an imprint. <laughs> yes, they gon' know I'm here. The world is gonna yeah, be my yeah. stage. And when I'm long gone, they, they gon' talk about me. They gon' read about me. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave a legacy, a legacy. Yes, you and me gon' make history. Wasted potential is the death of me. This planet of dead men who live Cause their words live on Though they've been long gone Yes, I know I wanna be like me I've got a place to be Come on, you just stop the dance in the road Every breath is getting 
getting longer I feel my heart sink into the ground And every weakness is getting stronger And as I'm falling I can feel you lift me up underneath your wings And just every touch how you take my love and bring it back to life, you bring it back to life, I feel your fire burn underneath my skin and it's every touch how you take my love and bring it back to life, you bring it back to life, and I'm breathing in every single sound you make, I can feel your words all in the Your voice making my heart beat If your soul is all I see It's like the rest of the world is not there It feels like time slows down And every breath is getting longer My heart sink into the ground And every weakness is getting stronger And as I'm falling I can feel you lift me up underneath your wings And it's every touch how you take my love and bring it back to life You bring it back to life Fire burn underneath my skin And it's every touch How you take my love and bring it back to life You bring it back to life And as I'm falling down I feel you lift me up Underneath your wings And it's every touch How you take my love and bring it back to life You bring it back to life I feel your fire burn underneath my skin and this every touch how you take my love and bring it back to life you bring it back to What's going on, y'all? It's Ralph A. World. And this is Mia Mendez. We are the stars of the new film, Boston to Philly, and we're hanging out with the Stephen Knight Show. Make sure you guys catch the episode and watch Boston to Philly online now. Welcome back to the Stephen Knight Show. Uh, we're mind all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, and, of course, our official website, thestephennightshow.com. You can also check us out on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, iTunes. Just go to our website. All right, so Bill Clinton, was, he's been promoting this new book he has, and he was on um, NBC doing an interview with James Patterson, and they brought up the whole Me Too movement. And, the, and James asked him would he have handled uh, the Monica Lewinsky, you know, the ending of that, you know, the way he dealt with that towards the end, would he handle that differently? And he said that he pretty much, I apologize to everyone. I apologize to my family. I apologize to her and her family. I did it publicly, but I have not talked, I have not spoken to her one-on-one privately. And so the question was, do you believe that if he made a public apology to the world, does she deserve a, a one-on-one personal apology? Would you me personally, I'm trying to understand what it exactly is the apology for. Mm-hmm. Oh, apology for because she got the backlash after, um, you know, when it all came out. She got the backlash, and for the last 20 years, she's had to deal with this, and she hasn't really been able to make a name for herself outside of that situation. So, should he apologize to her personally, or was his public apology to the world? You know, she he apologized to her and her family to the world, but he did not call her personally and apologize to her. Does she does, does she need both, or should he have done both? 
I mean, I think, I mean, I think, I think, I think when you harm, when you harm somebody, you don't get to tell them how to feel about it. And, and I, I certainly am not in the position to tell her whether or not she needs or deserve or personal. And that's what she's telling us that she. Well, she didn't ask for it. They were just asking her. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, people are asking her. Well, if she's yeah, separated, leave her alone. Yeah. Because last I, I mean, if I remember correctly, this was something that she consented to. This wasn't a situation where he took advantage of her. Mm-hmm. She was really ready, willing, and able. Yeah. They're saying, I think with the whole Me Too movement, the fact that, and even though, yeah, it, it was consensual, but the fact that he was the president of the United States and she was a, a White House intern. You know, they're saying a 23-year-old girl, of course she would be, the whole, you know, the whole The whole power play? Yeah, the whole exactly. power play thing? As a woman, I totally get that, and I see exactly what they're saying, and I in, in agreement with it. We're very impressionable mm-hmm. at that age, and even at my age. You know, women are women are impress, impress, impressionable by power, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. but when you're 23, you have no experience with that, and so you are put in situations where you wouldn't make the decision that you would make at 33, at 23. So, and I see women who are 33. And are not immature to make that decision, but I get it. I, I think power changes the situation. But if I'm what I'm saying is, if she's not asking for it, what's it to us? Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, just that, to me, that's just so stupid. Like somebody that's gone with their lives, they're doing. You know what I mean? If she didn't come out and say I need an apology, who are we to say he needs to apologize? Like that's just so dumb to me. Mm-hmm. That's like me going to and saying, hey, you know, call your uncle and tell your uncle he needs to apologize to you for something he said to you. When you were 20 years ago. And I had nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Logical sense. No. It's stupid. What, what, what I'm not a fan of is the, the now um, era of the Me Too movement, that they're now going back and rehashing all of these old situations. Right. Of the, the Me Too movement. Um, I, 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 I feel like there's something wrong with that. I mean, even though there, there may have been injustice done in the past, if nothing, if nothing negative has come from that and the person hasn't spoken of that from yesteryear or yesterday, why take this movement and go back and then rehash all those things all over again if – I mean, I think no one involved. Like if no one involved is saying anything, if no one involved is willing to talk right, about it right. or that's bringing anything thing. up, right, why why right. do that? Well, the thing is because it's still showing up. So apparently there was an event just a few months ago, and uh, Monica Lewinsky was scheduled to appear at the event, and then at the last minute, Bill Clinton RSVP and said he was coming, so they rescinded Monica Lewinsky's uh, invitation so that it wouldn't be an uncomfortable situation. So, no, it's still something that's still playing out 20 years later. So I think that's why they bring it up. No, I think the media is just upset because if Monica Lewinsky wasn't upset that she was that her invitation was rescinded, why are we upset? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, my thing is, is, is it, doesn't, it doesn't involve us. Like, so Monica Lewinsky was disinvited because they didn't want to cause me any issue with people being uncomfortable. To me, that's the right call. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But the, the organizers would say, you know what, we don't want the media mess. We don't want this to be about that, so we're going to go ahead and, and, and you know, it's more important that he's here. I, I honestly think that was more responsible on that, on that organization and, and, um, and the people who were in charge of making that decision than having both of them come up there and making the media mess. So I think yeah, that would have been messy. They don't want to concentrate on real news. Mm-hmm. They, they like sensationalizing things. And to me, th- this whole conversation about whether or not Monica Lewinsky needs an apology is just it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I do agree with that. All right, so our last story, everyone's been talking about this whole Pusha T and Drake uh, beef. So you know, they've been going back and forth with diss tracks. Well, Pusha T released the, the last one, the story of Added On, where he uh, said that Drake had alleged secret, secret son that he was a deadbeat dad to from this porn star. Um, the porn star came out and said that, allegedly said that it is his son, um, the son's name is. I'm sorry. I can't think. Of it. Okay. Oh, yeah. His son's name is Adonis, and him and Drake have the same uh, initials: A D G, Drake Audrey, Drake Graham, and Adonis D Graham. And so sources close to the porn star, or the uh, the mother, the baby mother, she says. Oh, and they're also born on the same day, October 24th. But she says that. 
although Drake was not there when she conceived, once uh, paternity, you know, it was discovered that it was his son, he has been secretly sending them, you know, the mom and the son to come spend time with the family, even so with Christmas. Now, Drake's camp is saying that no blood test has been done, so nothing's been confirmed, but she's saying that there, there has been. Um, anyway, Jay Price, who is the CEO of, I'm trying to think, it's a record label, I'm trying to think of the name, he's really well respected in the industry. He said that he made a call to Drake and told Drake not to respond to Pusha T's, um, his, his dist- diss track, not to, uh, you know, because it was very, very heated. He said that he said he told him not to respond to it. He pretty much said that because what Pusha T he feels like he did was he didn't just come after Drake in the song. He came after his family member. He talked about his dad who apparently is not doing well. He came after his mom and now he's come, you know revealing stuff about his son. And he's saying that's that's the um, that's prison that's prison mentality. And he said don't don't get involved in that. Um, no word on whether or not Drake is going to listen to him. Drake has an album coming out, so some people are thinking he might come out with a song on the on the album. Apparently, uh, Pusha T released statement saying or a tweet saying that he heard through the grapevine that Drake was offering large sums of money to find out, uh, you know, to find out, you know, scandal on Pusha T. But Pusha T said there's no scandal to find out, so. What do you think? Do you think Drake should continue this uh, this um, beef, or should he let it go? Take the uh, take Jay Price's advice. Let me go first, CK, because I'm not going to be long. So when I landed also from Cuba, this is one of the things that came across my timeline. Um, and you made a statement that he wasn't there when the baby was conceived. You mean when the baby was delivered? I mean delivered. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, he was there for conception. Yeah. <laughs> but um. I I haven't listened to any either side of as far as the track is concerned. I just think black folks we got to do better. We got to do better. Of all the stuff that's going on against like with us, we worrying about Drake and Pusha T on a beef, and we're putting two black men against each other. Two black men who can do well and stand out on their own that we sh- that we can support both. I don't know. I just, I'm, I guess I'm not in that mindset. It's, it's just, it, to me, this whole thing is just like so low vibration. Mm-hmm. Like, I, and I, and I, hate, I hate to like talk from a spiritual standpoint, but this is like the, 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 at the core of why our community is, is, is the way it is. Like of all the stuff that's going on with us in this country, we always have, I mean, my timeline was blowing up. And I was mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Trump is making laws. We might be back in slavery next week. What are y'all talking about? <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out. So I just, I just think, I think this mentality of, of how we beat each other down and how we, and, 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 and I mean, I've been very mindful of like with the, with the, um, the, the playoffs. Cause I used to be very much into like rooting for whatever team I wanted to be making mean comments and statements on, on, on you know, whatever team was losing or whatever, whoever I was against. I'm even more mindful of like, okay, I, I may say things here because obviously I'm a sports, a basketball fan and I'm going to root for the team that I want to root for. But I, right. I've already made a pledge to myself that I'm not going to beat down a player. I'm yeah. participating in a, in a, in a, in a, um, in the mean spirited comment about beating somebody down. I, I need to be more mindful of how I say it, why I say things. And I think that's a personal decision that we all have to make, whether or not we participate in something like this. So I don't have an opinion on whether or not, you know, Drake should respond or anything. I think he, he probably should take the high road. He's the most successful person in between the two in this whole situation. He has more to lose. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's an incredible artist. He's made his mark in this music industry. And I think Pusha T has a point to make, and so when you when you don't have as much to lose, you take better, you take more risk. That's yeah, fact of life. That's true. So, I just leave it at that. What about you, uh, Chica? <laughs> so as long as I can remember, going back in the days of hip hop, playing the dozens and talking about each other and digging deep and insulting your opponent has been a part of the game. Um, it's a part of the culture of hip-hop. Now, 
being an artist, I, I'm, I'm taking a little offense to that because this whole narrative now of we have to be so polite and so, you know, politically correct to the next person. We have to watch what we say all the time. When it comes to art and creativity, now it's it's bordering on being censored. And especially in the hip-hop community, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be what it used to be. The art form will change if artists are now going to be censored as to what they're going to say to each other. They've been battling since the beginning of time. That's how hip-hop got started on the corners, people battling each other. So what? If if the fans are liking it and the fans are soaking it up, then go for it. If you're in the game, you have to be willing to deal with the shots that come your way. Shots were fired. Retaliate back. It's only going to make you money. That's what I'm saying. That's where I'm coming from. I don't care, personally. Well, I, I, think, um, I think there's – yeah, there has been, uh, you know – battle rapping and diss tracks and all that, but I think there's a a level, a, a limit that you don't cross. You know what I mean? And talking about someone's ailing father and all that, I mean, yeah. Um, but but, but what, what Ms. Parker says comes into play with, you know, his desperation. Look at right, Jake because, and look at Pusha T. That's what I'm two saying. different artists at two different levels. And, and, and prior to this, Pusha T was not that relevant. You know, prior to uh, this back and forth. So I think Dre should take the high road, take the L. You know, they're saying that, that he lost this. But uh, a lot of people are saying that Drake Drake's song sounded like it was something that would be played on the radio, like a hit, while Pusha T sound like he was uh, Wendy Williams or Angela Lee from The Breakfast Club gossiping. <laughs> so uh, he wasn't talking about Drake. He was talking about everything but Drake. And so it's yeah, they're no, both. Kika made a good point though that that hip hop started with a with the idea of two people battling and going back right. and forth and you know and, and trying to out outsmart each other mm-hmm. as far as kind of pushing each other. I get that, but I also think that there's there's been some limit that's been crossed that we've seen mm-hmm. in our generation with Tupac and Big. Yeah. How far things went because it got personal. They started talking about effing each other's wives and yep. with moms and and it got deadly. Yeah. Well, I mean, that. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you remember back to um, cannabis, and I think it was LL Cool J, they were like vicious rivals talking about each other's families back in the day, and that's hence where Mama said "knock you out" came from because cannabis was coming for LL's mom, and then he had to annihilate him, and he was in a position to annihilate him. And I say the same to Drake. You're in the position to annihilate Pusha T. I say go for it. Shut him up. Well, everybody's listening. We'll see what happens when these albums drop. Well, listen, Miss Parker, Chike, I know you stand up for movie reviews. Miss Parker, have a great week. I'll see you in the gym tomorrow and at work. <laughs> and, uh, have a great week, guys. <laughs> all right. We'll be right back, you, after, <laughs> right back after this. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. That's the nigga they chasing, but they too passy Jackie. Man get never safe, safe. Man get never safe, safe. I'm well on your way, waiting. Man I'm in a setting. That's the nigga they chasing, but they too passy Jackie, Jackie. I said that you pass, she wait till she check it. She looking and she not know what they are talking. I told her that trouble she causing the way that she rocking and shaking her too much. Only not far too matter. For the only let she fuck a cat All the men is scatter. Now all been it, I want in a track fly. When you tie your lap and you wear your skin test. When you rocking your too much. Bang I want my ring. Chamu, I want to. Man, it 
they sent him. Next thing they got, they chasing. But they drew past, she checking. My girl never suffer, eh. What the you not see funk get capping? Like I said before, hungry line blocking. You leave it, another scam and we'll buy pay. Grab it, squeeze it, we'll dry face. That it done, you will be trying how to catch it. You know you're missing a casa bamba bete. Fix it, oh five, trying how to catch it. Then you won't speak serious now till they get Pretty girl, let me take you out of dinner. I got a cheddar, forgive me, I was a sinner. Gonna be better from January down to December. Take trips, go to spots even in the winter. So sexy, gorgeous, and beautiful. Everything that we do is memorable. I'm feeling you from your head down to your toes. Don't have to speak, gonna, I'm gonna show. That's the nigga they chasing, but they drew past she checking. My girl never suffer, eh? Suffer, eh? My girl never suffer, eh? Suffer, eh? I'm gonna lie on the waiting, but I'm in the setting. That's the nigga they chasing, but they drew past she checking, checking, checking. Anytime she walking, yeah. the boy them be watching. The boy them be watching. Anytime she walking, yeah. the boy them be jacking. The boy them be jacking. Baby girl, you temptation. Anytime you turn girl, you confusion. Baby girl, you temptation. Anytime you turn girl, you confusion. Baby girl, you blow my mind away. Anytime you turn. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's the First Lady Faith Evans, and you're listening to the Stephen Knight Show. Welcome back to the Stephen Knight Show. Ralph Anthony Celestine is an award-winning filmmaker and most notably recognized for his critically acclaimed film, Boston to Philly, which has screened throughout the entire globe in various highly competitive and noteworthy film festivals such as the Pan-African Kings Film Festival in France, uh, San Francisco Black Film Festival, and the Roxbury International Film Festival where he received the K-Born Emerging Film Filmmaker Award. Now tonight... He and his co-star, Mia Mendez, join us to tell us more. Please help me welcome Ralph A. Celestine and Mia Mendez. Welcome to the show. Hello. <laughs> Listen, I, I mean, I was reading up on this film, and I mean, you are doing some big things with this. You, you're doing some big things. <laughs> Before we get into it, tell us a little bit about your background, Ralph. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate the uh, the love, Stephen. You know, big fan of the show. Um, yeah, so I've actually, I've been a filmmaker for as long as I can remember. It's going back now for about uh, eight or nine years of me putting out this quality content that I think speaks about our race, who we are as a people, and just about topics of political evolution and love. Yeah, and that's really what it boils down to, man. It's been an artist that uses his platform to push out the right agenda that I think is right. Awesome, awesome. So tell us about Boston to Philly. What was the inspiration behind it? Kind of what was your process in creating this film? Okay, well, my, my inspiration was actually the character that Mia Mendez plays, which is Philly. Uh, my inspiration when I was coming from Boston to Philadelphia, that's my life story. Mm-hmm. I traveled and I moved there for a job. And going into Philadelphia for the first time, I fell in love with it right off the bat. Yeah. And that's kind of what the story's about. I fall in love with, with Mia Mendes' character, which is dubbed Philly. Uh-huh. That's really what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. And Mia, tell us a little bit about your background. 
Hi. Yes. Well, I began my career as a radio personality. Okay. So um, for, I guess, about seven, eight years I've done radio. Um, I'm from Philly, went to Temple University, so okay. study broadcasting. And towards the later part of my radio career, I, I, you know, transitioned into acting. I started taking some acting classes in New York, um, studied acting there for a while, and then started emerging into the independent, mainly the independent uh, film community in Philadelphia. Awesome, awesome. And now we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about your, the uh, character you play, Mia. Tell us about Philly. So she, um, she's awesome. She's so many different things. I have to say I feel really blessed to um, been able to play her because as actors we like to take on roles that are very versatile and have a lot of layers. Right. Philly, her character, the character of Philly definitely has that. Um, she has a lot of emotion behind her. So you see, you know, at the surface, you see some, you see anger, um, and then you begin to see where that comes from, the, um, some pain and some hurt. But there's also, you know, moments where she's flirtatious. And so there was a lot of different things I got to play with in playing Philly. So, yeah, I loved it. Awesome. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want to interrupt Mia because she's, she's very humble. She's <laughs> But she actually ended up winning Best Actress at the Las Vegas. Oh wow! Wow! Congratulations! Yeah, <laughs> Thank that, you that so was, much. Was well, Ralph, why was why was Mia perfect for this role? Obviously, Best Actress. I mean, it speaks for itself. But for you as the filmmaker, why was she perfect for this role? Well, she was perfect because I know just from showing up to the audition in itself showed the dedication she had for her craft. Cause like, see, mm. I'll tell you when I when I put up the auditions for the movie, like we're we're indie, like we are right. we are you know we're just the epitome of an indie filmmaking group. Mm -hmm. I rented out this dungeon, this hole in the wall basement uh, community center where I, to have the auditions. The day of the auditions, it was storming out. It was raining in the middle of the night. No one even showed up. So wow. I walked in, and that in itself let me know this person is dedicated because yeah. she came in the rain. To make it happen, because the most women don't want to get their hair messed up. But Mia said she she wants this role. She wants this role. <laughs> no, she came in playing. She really came in playing. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you know, we were talk we talked about this on the show a lot. Um, it seems like, you know, I love Netflix now. Um, a lot of the the big budget movies. You know, of course, we have the good ones, of course, Black Panther now and all that. But a lot of them were telling the same stories over and over again. And you're finding more of the creative and interesting content in indie film. Do you feel that way? Mia, you want to go first? Oh, I, I was thinking that was a, a question for the filmmaker himself. I definitely, I mean, I, you, know you mentioned what? Black Panther. I, I think one thing, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to say very quickly, I think that what happens is, you know, the, the more mainstream it gets, you feel a little bit more pressure into doing things a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, in the indie film, you, you have a lot more freedom. So I yeah, think that, yeah. That's possible, that, you know, that's part of it. That's part of it. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. And, and that freedom, and so that freedom is really what I value the most. To answer your question, Stephen, in a little different light, I like the idea of just telling my own story with no one basically putting me in a box or censoring me. Even with Black Panther, I love the story of Black Panther, but I feel as though the biggest reason why we didn't get an origin piece of Black Panther is because those that know Black Panther, the comic book series, know that mm -hmm. Black Panther fought and defeated Captain America. Like, so I don't think Amer I don't I don't think America wanted to push that out there and let people know. Black Panther is actually more is a lot more powerful than the quintessential American hero that is Captain America. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, yeah. I'm sure you know, Stephen. So that's just one example of I just I like the idea of just putting something out where I have full control of the narrative and the story. Most definitely, I get that. I get that. So tell us about the premise behind Boston to Philly. Well, it's a coming of age drama, and it basically it's a cast ensemble piece. So what it does is. It pulls, it pulls together all these different characters and their story arcs, and it brings it to one cohesive theme and story. So it stars myself as Rome Williams, a.k.a. Boston, 
which he's dealing with all these different levels of depression, which he goes through throughout the film because he loses his parents in a tragic accident right before the championship game in high school. And from there, he needs to move to Philadelphia. Okay. So that's really the main storyline. And, of course, the backbone of the film is a love story between Rome, a.k.a. Boston, and Mia Mendez's character, Philly, or Carolina, a.k.a. Philly. And it okay. you how they transpire and what they go through throughout the, the hour and 47 minutes the story is told. And I can imagine it's a lot of ins and outs because you go with someone who's gone through that much trauma and then relocating to a new city and then falling in love. I'm sure there's a lot of issues that happens, you know, to, to get, you know, to a good space. Yeah. Exactly. That says even, you know, he deals with even drama with me because yeah. I'm, not, I'm not so clean cut in character. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so then there's that on top of what he's already been going through. Well, uh, yes, uh, and that's the stuff that people can relate to. You know, everyday people can relate to. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ross. Well, I just want to throw one more thing in there. So, uh, there was one element of Mia Mendez's character that I really wanted to put out there when I wrote the film, and Mia did a really good job of of handling. Was besides the fact that we shoot in different locations in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. we actually went to North Philly. We actually shot inside of a, a very popular and sometimes controversial uh, bike club. Mm. Mia Mendes' character, she's actually involved in the bike club community. Okay. Mia, Mia actually was on set live with, like, in that environment and around those people. So she, when you say relatable, she, she really made the story as real as it could be by embodying the role and the character in the location. Wow, so that's wow. Gonna, that's going to help with that. Well, I know that all movies have their challenges when being created, and I would imagine even more so in the indie world. What were some of the challenges you had to work around to make this successful project? Man, you know, I have to say the, the biggest challenge was getting people – wow, you know, I, I don't even I, – I'd say the biggest I feel challenge like was, it might be – was it scheduling? I was going to say that, yeah, getting everyone on set at the same time. Mm, okay. Okay. I think that's a big one as far as indie projects. You know, you you just have to find people that are truly committed, um, committed to their craft. You really do. Yeah. Yeah. So once the project is completed, and then it's sent to these film festivals and it's accepted, I mean, what what's going through our mind now? Like, I mean, I can only imagine. I'm a little okay. I'll be honest. I'm a, I'm ex, I'm excited. I'm like overly excited because I've been you know waiting the time for it to be released to the public in this way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I went through the nerves of different screenings and film festivals and watching it like literally in the back of the theater with other people there because I didn't want to be seen. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, like, I'll just sit in the back. So this is kind of crazy. This is the this is for me the first leading role that I've had that is actually being released mm. um, to the public in this realm. I, you know, I've done different screenings and things of that nature um, and web series. But, yeah, this is the first film, feature film, that's being released for me. So I'm, I'm excited and nervous at the same time, but it's good nerves. It's more like an anxiousness. Yeah, yeah, I get that. What about for you, Rob? Well, Stephen, just to kind of throw it out there, I don't know if I, if I mentioned this to you, but Mia just moved to the Mecca uh, she's now in Atlanta. So, uh, oh, yeah. Welcome to the A. Welcome to the A. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. How are you liking out here? Oh, my gosh. I'm loving Atlanta. I really yeah. am. I've only been here, I've been here literally two months. So I okay, can't... yeah. Yeah, you, you knew. You knew. Yeah. I got to tell you some of the good spots to hit up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Need all types of advice, but yeah, I'm here, and you know, I've come to Atlanta to pursue even bigger opportunities. Yeah, I'm excited. It's interesting. It's time, yeah. It is. It is about timing. You're right. You're right. You're right. I interviewed. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Aaron D. Uh, I can't think of his last name, which is going to kill me. But he's on uh, uh, Young and the Restless, and he's been oh. in a bu- bunch of movies. Um, 
I interviewed him, and he was telling me just about, you know, the the process for him, you know, and in, in, in getting roles and keeping yourself relevant and, and keeping up with the, the times and everything. What were some of the things you had to learn in terms of getting your name out there, getting that recognition, you know, and, and just, you know, keeping your ear to the streets kind of thing? Well, oh, you know, you kind of meant you, – you actually answered – is that for me or is that for me? Both of you, both of you. I can imagine as a filmmaker and actor and then as an actress, I'm sure, you know, you both have to do it in your own ways. Go talk, go talk. I, I'm going to tell you um, right now, Stephen, I mentioned this with Mia, that I, you know, I'm, I, I consider myself a very thrilled person. I like to meet people in person. So the way I did to kind of get my name out there and let people know that I'm really about this and to believe in me and this project was by going to the places where I felt as though our fan base was. Mm-hmm. So every single person, where every single place where we shot the movie, I had personally been there. I met with the owners, or I met with the the the, the, the president of the bike club, and I shook their hands and I spoke. Yeah, yeah. So I felt as though there's an element where you can keep your ear close to the ground, you can do your work on social media, but at the end of the day, if you're not trying to be a foot soldier, then I don't. There's not gonna, no one's gonna go to battle with you. No one's gonna go to war with you. you so you do more. You did more of a grassroots approach, kind of. Uh, I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And his name is Aaron D. Spears, by the way. <laughs> Aaron D. Spears. But yeah, that's a... <laughs> he also was on uh, Be and Mary Jane. Um, nice. Yeah. What about what, what about you, uh, Mary? What's your strategy? How do you do that? Well, in well, when I was in Philly and just over the years, one of you know one of the great things in regards to staying relevant and having your name out there was that I you know I was a radio personality. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that big. Yeah. I can see that. Amazing platform, and, and um, you know, in doing that, that built my social media at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but now that, you know, I'm not on radio right now um, and moving here to Atlanta, I'm pursuing different opportunities. I'm open to a lot of things um, and doing my own research. And just, you know, because it's a, it's a new market, it's a new place. Right, um, that's true. Uh, yeah, so... You know, even though I'm not on radio now, it's not something that I'm opposed to. You know, if that happens here in Atlanta, that'd be great. And, you know, and going from there. But, yeah, it's a brand-new playing field for me now. So it's almost like kind of starting from the beginning. But at the same time, like Ralph said, it's about timing. It's like I, I come here with a purpose. And at that, at the very same time that I come here with this purpose in, in um, pursuing – higher levels within my acting career, here comes Boston the Philly releasing to the public, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting for me. I'm, I'm a singer. I'm not an actor in any way, shape, or form. Although I thought I could be a pretty good one. We'll see. Anyway, well, one day, uh, <laughs> one of the producers on, on our show, he uh, told me, you know, you should, since you live in Atlanta, you should submit some headshots uh, to Tyler Perry Studios. You know, since you live in Atlanta, and I and I happened to be doing a photo shoot right around that time. I said, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So I I did the photo shoot, got my photos, I had everything packaged up, and I get an email from Tyler Perry Studios. I hadn't even sent out the package, and they wanted me to. <laughs> it was it was so they saw videos of me on YouTube, and so they were casting for a play, and I really didn't want to do a play, but I you know I didn't want to turn out an opportunity. I just wanted to see what would happen. So I remember I was sick as a dog, went down there, did the audition, and I was like, it's a lot harder than you think it is. <laughs> it's a lot harder than you think it is. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the audition. Okay. Yeah. No, it's, it's pressure. It is pressure. Yeah, it's, Steven, it's one of those things you have Stella to Perry? do constantly. Yeah, exactly. No, I didn't. I, I met a casting director. It was funny because, you know, you know, his studio since has now moved, but um, the old studio, is a, it was in the middle of the hood, and so once you turn into it, get through security, then you see, it's like, ah, you know, the, <laughs> it's real right. nice. And so you, you go inside, and there's a woman at the front desk, and I told her I was here to audition. I had my script with me, which I thought it was like wrong script because it was for a 15-year-old. And uh, so the cast director said, she said, no, 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 you know, he, he'll cast anyone for different, you know, roles. So I'm sitting in the, uh, sitting in the waiting area, 
and there's this guy sitting beside me. I, I would imagine he was auditioning for the same role. The thing was, I was literally sick as a dog. Like, I, I started this thing every few uh, months where my voice would go out, my singing voice. It would like, I just get hoarse for like, it could go to two to three months. And this is when everything was happening. I was getting calls for the voice and all this other stuff. Anyway, so I went in there, and, I, and she's like, okay, we're going to go through it before we start recording. And I said, well, you know I'm not 15, right? <laughs> she's like, no, don't worry about that. So I, I, I read my line. She said, hold on, Steven, Steven, Steven. Let me explain to you what's going on at this time. So she wanted me to get the emotion. And I, 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 well, I didn't get the role, <laughs> but but <laughs> but, uh, but I, I imagined the guy beside me because I could hear him. He went in before me, and I heard him singing, and he was, like, amazing. And so, uh, but I don't know, I just thought it was weird. You know how you look at these actors, like the old throwback audition tapes? And I'm like, I have an audition tape somewhere out there. So if I ever become a big star, you know, <laughs> it's out there. That's going to be a throwback. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I might even find that one, Mia. I might put that. I might put that out. <laughs> you might need that. Well, look, with all this uh, recognition, you know, that you are getting. So, when does the when does the film release to the public? Yep. So June sixth is going to be the day where you'll be able to be live. Uh, right now, we're going to be exclusively on Amazon Prime. Okay. You'll awesome. Watch it. You'll be able to own it and or stream it June sixth on Amazon Prime. And then from there, a short time later, we're going to be on Google Play, iTunes, Fandango, Vudu. Uh, we've gotten the green light on almost every platform. So That's dope. by the end of June, you'll be able to see it pretty much anywhere. You have a tablet, TV, computer, you name it, phone. That's dope. That's dope. So I know we'll be about to uh, release this to the public. What's next for you, Ralph? Honestly, I, I was thinking about this. Next is just relaxing and figuring out where where this the, the next kind of inspiration will come yeah. from. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do have a second film that I'm wrapping up, but in, until it's officially done, I don't even want to put it out there yet because boxing right. really is the priority. That's my main focus. Yeah. And I'm hoping I can get hit with some inspiration so that I can really make a film that just changes – Changing the, the playing field. I, I don't want to make a quintessential black film or a quintessential love story. I want to do something that really hasn't been done before, similar to a Boston Two film. Okay. All right. And Mary, I know you just moved to the A. What's, what's next for you? Yes. yes. Um, since I just got here, I am, as Ralph said, he's going to be in relax mode. I cannot be in relax mode. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I'm here, you know, I'm finally feeling situated. Um, I, you know, when I first got here, I didn't have my own, my apartment yet. So I've been in my place a good three weeks and got everything I need from Philly. Um, so now that I'm feeling situated, you know, my, my goal is to get into the, the acting community here. I, mm-hmm. I, get back, I definitely want to get back into um, some classes out here just to kind of make my way in, in meeting the film community in Atlanta but yes, um, going after castings, I will be visiting Tyler Perry Studios. Like, yeah. All that stuff, you know, all that nice, stuff. nice. And you'll get the role. I won't. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's grind mode. And also um, looking into not just acting, but also um, TV hosting opportunities. I yeah. Have, um, some television hosting as well. There's an event I have coming up on the 16th uh, that I'm hosting here in Atlanta. It'll be my first event, so I'm excited about awesome. that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so different things, but, it, you know, I post about it. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Well, tell everyone where they can, uh, again, where they can see the film and um, how to connect with you all on your social media. Ralph, you can go first. Uh, yeah, so make sure everyone check out the film. It's Boston to Philly. Any way you spell it, Boston, the number two Philly. We also made it more easy for you to search it online. So if you want to type in Boston T.O. Philly, Anywhere you have a computer, tablet, phone, you'll be able to see the film. We're going to be exclusively on Amazon Prime, so you'll be able to stream it, and you'll be able to purchase it from that platform. And uh, make sure you guys follow the journey on Boston, the number two Philly Instagram. We're on Facebook, and my personal account is Ralph A. World, and that's on Instagram and Facebook as well. So All right. Support, indie, support, support good work. Please do. Please do. What about you, Mia? 
Yes, uh, my Instagram is at Mia underscore Mendez, at Mia underscore Mendez, and my Facebook is Mia Mendez on FB, and all those links are on my website if you go to MiaMendez.com. Ralph, A. Celestin, and Mia Mendez, thank you so much for taking time out your schedule, and congratulations on all the success and continued success, and uh, I just thank you for your time tonight. Thank yes. you so much. Thanks I appreciate it. It was a good time. Most definitely. And listen, for more information about Boston to Philly, go to the and we'll be right back after this. Oh, 
Stephen Knight Show. Make sure you check out that Love Me Back. Welcome back to the Stephen Knight Show. Our next guest was once a background singer for the one and only Erica Badu, but has since gone on and made a name for herself, becoming a Grammy-nominated songwriter and vocalist. Her latest project, Air Castle, which is an EP she teamed up with uh, All Cows Eat Grass, is now available, and tonight she joins us to tell us more. Please help me welcome very talented Nadambi. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Stephen. I'm really did, glad to be here. Oh, I'm so glad to have you here. You know, let's let's get into it. You know, you you're a woman who has done a lot in your career. Tell us kind of how you got started. Well, I officially got started like most singing in church. Yeah. Um, I was <laughs> the church, and I sang there, and that was the auditioning. You know, the auditioning table right there. Exactly. And from there on, I just knew I loved singing in my whole life, and. Um, I always did something musically from playing a piano, playing piano, practicing piano lessons and clarinet lessons, and and then from there always singing in the choir still. But I didn't know how I was going to translate that into me actually becoming a singer. Right. And eventually, over time, I went to SMU, graduated with a, a degree in creative writing, and I just happened to go into an audition for after I graduated from college for a theater. Uh, workshop theater piece that was going on that was local to Dallas and it was in those moments that I you know I, I met a wonderful group of women who were doing some really good cool and creative things that had went off and done some things and come back and I met Erica and that, she was a part of that group wow and from there we wow. just kind of uh, hung out just started doing cypher well she was already doing her thing she was already on the scene locally okay and then i started hanging out and doing the cypher circles we'd go in the middle and sing when people would rhyme and she and she and on her behalf she might rhyme or sing exactly and, uh, it kind of translated from there and then it, we met we the both of us made a pact that whoever got a um deal first would take the other on the road and she just stayed true to her word and and there you go. I got started singing background with her. And then from there, I, while I was doing that, I decided to work on some solo music because I always knew in my heart I wanted to be solo. Right. And started working on that as well. And now, <laughs> now here I am. <laughs> exactly. Here you are. Let me ask you, how did, yeah. how did uh, singing for her background prepare you for your solo career? Wow. Well, uh, singing background for her. Well, first of all, I did before doing Erica's, um, working with her, mm-hmm. I had no former knowledge of being in, in, in the business, in the music right. business. Mm-hmm. And Dallas is not a town where you go and you get a record deal immediately in right. the house and then stay at home. You would have to go away to get one. So I learned a lot about um, musicianship, um, uh, impromptu uh, create, creations. I learned right. about time. Mm-hmm. And being working as a group and as a team, it was just so much. It was a learning experience. I really yeah. appreciate it because it was kind of like uh, if I could have went to college for music, and that was where I went to learn and study. That was mm-hmm. what it was. It was a, a learning, big learning 
experience for me. Yeah, and I know that you love writing. You you, I mean that's you, you graduated. You know, doing that. Uh, tell us about your writing. Tell us, you know, what what, what you know. Tell us about your writing. Okay, well, because um, I always when I started writing, I always thought that I would write a book. Okay. And at the time I started, I didn't have a book of information to write, any book or a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Um, I hadn't seen enough yet to tell any stories that long. And so all the stories I kept writing were short stories. I turned all my stuff into a publisher, and they were like, this is really nice, but if you want to write a book, write a book first and then send it to us. And I was like, I don't know if I've lived enough to write the book yet, so let me go no, digress and go back and see what else I can do with this writing. Well, right. since they are stories, I might as well just fit them into a song and mm. start songwriting. So I started from that perspective. Okay. And, um, I kind of started my first craftings of songs were, of course, horrible. But uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, was, <laughs> I was proud to start, you know. They, exactly. You can't be great at it. You have to practice. So mm-hmm. practicing and then just – I. I realize my specialty is to tell stories in music. I like to be the narrator telling the story and painting the picture and giving people the opportunity to fit them in that story how they see fit. Right, right. Well, while you were working with Erica, I I know that you released three uh, independent albums uh, and you were able to perform that music practically all over the world. What was it like going to, yeah. you know, especially back then, what was it like, you know, going to different countries and singing your music? Well, it was wonderful to go and sing it. But I think that the really awesome thing was going to these places and when CDs were still cool, mm-hmm. people already having a CD. Yeah. And, you, and at that time, I was doing it out the trunk of my car selling. So I'm like, how? <laughs> That's the peace style. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, and we're trying to figure out, but you know, also actually, I I mean, it wasn't it wasn't just that. I, I was affiliated with a a good band network, right? It was a company mm-hmm. called Southwest, and they got it out of places. But it was in my mind, I couldn't imagine it going that far. And to see people with the music, it was so awesome to see people already with the music and already yeah. singing songs. Yeah, so, I can imagine. Uh, that's always it, it. It just blew me away. Yeah. yeah. Just, think that they could they could uh, hear this music from this little old girl from uh, South Dallas, South Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> but that shows the power of music and how it can touch people, I mean, everywhere. I remember, uh, I, I haven't performed overseas, but I remember when I released the song and I saw the first person that bought it was in Japan. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's the power yes. of music, you know, power of music. Yes, it is. It is such a powerful language. Yeah. Like that, because that's so, what it is. So then you get signed um, to Stack Records, and you release Pink mm-hmm. Elephant, which becomes Grammy nominated. Did you know then yeah. you had, you had made it when you got that Grammy no- I No, know. I did not know I had made it. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think the real deal is, I think as long as you continue to work towards the mark, yeah, um, you still are so you have so many things that you would like to do and see happen. Mm-hmm. So I was grateful to be nominated, but I was still knowing that I had work to do. You're still on that grind, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So, but that was, a, I was truly, completely honored to be recognized. Uh, so that was, that was a great thing. So how would you say, you know, you have a new project out now. How do you say that you had evolved as an artist from those, obviously, the early days of Erica to the Grammy nominated um, album. How have you evolved now with your new music? Well, I think the evolution is evolution, evolution, mm-hmm. evolution <laughs> has been. Yeah, I'm gonna go on and use that word somewhere. Right. The evolution has been. <laughs> the evolution has been uh, more uh, being really shaped in another creative atmosphere. Yeah. Um, trying some things that I hadn't tried before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this album, I will tell you, in Air Castle is a collaborative effort with All Cows Eat Grass. Yeah. The front man of the All Cows Eat Grass is Terrence Brown. And to be yes. able to work with him, he was someone I really admired and respected and respected his genius. And I, I really 
enjoyed the opportunity to work with someone who thought a, a whole lot differently about music than I did yeah. and had a lot of different ideas. And I was, you know, I was, I was really open to it. And we really had a good time working and, you know, creating something unexpected to me I'm, because I'm not really sure I'm not, I, well, all the things that I can do, but I would like to try as many things as I can to get the sound out. Exactly. So it was, exactly. That, that's what it was. That was what it was. And what was the creative process in, in uh, working on this record? The creative process? What yeah. we did was we camped out we camped out at Terrence's place and we okay. just we just took took uh, the liberty to just take the time to really, really eat, sleep, breathe and talk music. Okay. And um we just kind of went in. I was telling him what I was listening to. He was telling me what he was listening to. We were then listening to other stuff, still discovering things. And and then it just kind of, from there, blossomed into what we have now. Right, right. So talk, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the uh, the new record. It is called Air Castle. Tell us about, why would you name it that? What's, what's the, the meaning behind that? Air Castle. The actual song, it's just kind of like taking you on a trip and uh-huh. kind of like to a place that's out of, you know, your norm. But it's a kind of elevated party. Let's say it's a curated party that okay. everyone wants to get into, but only certain people can get in if they know how to fly. They exactly. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. When what do you want your, the, your fans and new fans and your listeners to when they listen to that last track? What do you, which you want to be their takeaway from the music that we created? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, the Air Castle EP is really, I think, an, uh, a, a short story that tells you about yourself in your way. It's right. all in how you interpret it. It's what it means to you. It's it's very universal, so it's not limited to just what I think. It's limited to what you think in the next man. So this hopefully will incite people to to get active and do whatever, do and be whatever it is that they desire to do and be, or whatever they have that they want to see accomplished. Yeah, I, they do that. I did read you said that you want them to take away what what. What it brings to them, that's their takeaway. They, actually, that's yeah. a good way to look at it. Because you never know. I know, I yeah. can remember, I think it was uh, Danny Glover. He didn't want to talk about um, his song, uh, what's it called, America. <laughs> uh, this, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to talk about what it means. He wants people to take away their own, uh, walk with their own concept of that. I get that because mm-hmm. really what our job for me, if 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 we if we're doing it, I mean not to say I'm not judging anybody's walk and how you do music, but it's nice when you can make music that motivates people to do right. the action that they feel is deemed necessary to help them get on with their life and get yeah. on with their their day and what means what matters to them the most. Exactly, exactly. So what do you think about music today? What do you think about uh you know what we hear. Obviously, I have my own thoughts about what we hear on the radio, day in day out. But mm-hmm. what's your? What do you think about the state of music now today in 2018? Well, I mean, it's 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 like this. You could look at it half empty or half full. Yeah. And I'm gonna choose the half full side. Mm-hmm. On the half full side, what it it what it does mean is that you have an opportunity as a creative person to create whatever it is that you think that you feel like you mm-hmm. can create. We have yeah. all these uh, ways to get uh, access music and all these ways to get to people. So we have an opportunity to be to be our true self musically and create uh, things that matter to us the most. We can experiment way more. We can say way more. We can do way more in music. So this is that time for people that can put, you know, important things into it or not. But yeah. this is that time. It gives us an opportunity to be our fullest creative self. Exactly. And that's what's great about music right now in this moment in time. Most definitely, most definitely. So do you have any upcoming performances, or what do you, what do you have coming up, uh, you know, in support of this EP? Uh, we're, we're working on that now. I think okay. we'll be doing a lot more shows in the fall. I think that we're going to do some spot dates um, 
coming up soon, probably okay. this summer. And uh, but yeah, be people, everyone, y'all be on the lookout. But we Most are definitely. we're working on uh, putting together something. We want to do something really, really creative and fun, and yeah, give people a good time when they come to see this music because we feel I, like it's a good time. I was just uh, looking at some of the, your live performances on YouTube. I mean, you do your thing for sure. You do your thing for sure. <laughs> What's your, what's your, when you're up there on that stage, what's going on through your head? What, 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 you know, what's going on with you? Well, you know what? I think that, you know, I feel like there's two sides to me. And when mm-hmm. I'm on stage, I'm a lot more laid back and you know, right. yeah. kind of chill. But the person who gets on stage is my, and I'm a Gemini. So they say oh, yeah. that's when I think my sister is. is on stage. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. so she gets on stage, and then the other shy twin is at home. Right. And when she gets off stage, the other shot twin comes back. Mm. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Well, where can we where can we buy the um the record and um, keep up with you and everything you have going on in your, in your amazing career? Well, we can buy the music at all digital platforms. We're at Spotify. We're at Apple Music. We're at a band camp, and I think that we're at Google Music, anywhere you can buy music digitally, we are awesome. on, on all those platforms. And um, my social media, everything that I is uh, at Indombi, at Indombi, uh, for Man. Twitter, iTunes, I mean, I'm sorry, Twitter, IG, Instagram, uh, Facebook, all those things, same, same handle. Let me ask you, how has social media changed the game for you um, since, you know, early on in your career? One thing that social media has done is it has allowed an artist to be able to self-promote. Yeah. Uh, that's in an easier way, in an easier way and reach a lot more people than we could back in the day. Back in the day, you were handing out flyers, mm-hmm. you, to, you know, find mailing lists and exactly. email lists <laughs> and all that good stuff. But now you can just push a button. Click yep. and you can send it to as many people as you know, as many people as you meet on Facebook, yep. Instagram, all these things, and it makes it so easy. That part to promote yourself. So that's yeah, the one. Wonderful. I think that's my big takeaway about what social media has done. It has changed the game on how we can promote ourselves. Most definitely. Most definitely. Well, then, Dombi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I wish you continued success with this project and everything else is coming your way. Keep making great music. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Stephen. I really appreciate it. And I thank you, everyone who's listening. I appreciate this time and opportunity to be with you guys tonight. So, yes, thank you. Thank you well, so much. Well, thank you. Again, our thanks goes to the Army for joining us tonight. For more information, go to our website, the com, and we'll be right back after this. So perfect, I thought it was real But I couldn't tell, no Hey, mama I guess I thought that my moving image Would one day learn how to be still But that wasn't realistic Should've been good by now I should've been We should've been
Y'all boys so off, but I'm a hit Got no time to talk, I'm getting rich Can't hear you talking like I'm deaf And I kill no coffin with the shit Show Why? how to move like it's your only option Show them how to go, girl Cause you do it flawless She be like, he be like My haters be like, rep your town tonight And we only show them how it's done When your back is in the corner But your dream is number one
Welcome back to Stephen Knight's show. Adam, how's it going? Oh, how are you? I cannot complain, cannot complain. Survived the Monday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How was the weekend? Uh, it was pretty good. It was uh, it was cloudy on Saturday and rainy on Sunday. I think we're getting the residual rain you guys got earlier uh, yeah. this week. So it's been it's been it's been cloudy days, but hopefully it's getting better now. Oh, good, 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 good. All right. Well, I know you and Chike have a lot to discuss. So I'll let y'all take it away. All right, perfect. Well, I'll start uh, with just a quick hit because I did see two movies over the past couple weeks, and this one was one that's been out for a while, and it's uh, John Krasinski's movie, A Quiet Place. And uh, I typically avoid horror movies. They're just not my genre, but uh, after everyone said how good it was and they got so many good reviews, uh, we decided to check it out. And I was a little bit let down in the case of just an a overhyped movie, but... Um, yeah, there were some parts in it, and for anyone who hasn't seen it, the premise is that this is kind of the near future, and these aliens have, or monsters have uh, kind of attacked the population of the U.S., and this is a family that you have to live in silence because that's how the monster finds you. So everything in the movie is very quiet uh, to avoid any detection and it just goes through the story of this family living um, somewhere out in some country area, surviving. So, again, um, I know people liked it. To me, it was kind of a, a skippable one. Again, the horror stuff, there's just a certain, certain disbelief that you have to get through. And horror movies really do a lot of setup that you have to kind of believe that these things are really happening and these people are really doing something that doesn't seem logical. But um, if you're a fan of the horror movie, and again, it's gotten great reviews, definitely check it out um, if you're into that. The next movie I saw was, of course, the big release over Memorial Day weekend, Solo, A Star Wars Story. And this, for anyone who doesn't know, of course, follows the story of, it's not quite an origin story, but it's almost an origin story of Han Solo and how we learn about everything that is referenced in the original Star Wars movie. So this is, this is how he meets Chewbacca. This is his first time meeting Lando, how he ends up with the Millennium Falcon, even how he got the name uh, Han Solo. So to me, it was a fun movie. I know it's, a, it's been a little divisive, but um, I thought it was fun. You know, even uh, Alden Einrich did a good job. Uh, he kind of grew on me throughout the movie. He's no Harrison Ford, but everyone knows that going into it. And, it's really an adventure movie. It's, um, you know, if you thought The Last Jedi was a little dark and dismal, this one's more of just kind of here's Han Solo on his adventure. And uh, that's all you can really ask for. It's nothing amazing, but it's a fun movie. If you like the Star Wars universe, uh, definitely give it a shot. Just uh, don't, don't expect, um, you know, the original Han Solo kind of caliber. Yeah, and and how how um, Malia Clark? Oh, she did great. I thought you know I have, I've only seen her in Game of Thrones, uh, so I haven't seen her in Terminator or any other series uh, or films. So I thought she did a really good job, I, and that's one of the things I did like the acting. Um, Woody Harrelson did a fine job. Of course, uh, Donald Glover did a good job. And even the guy who was in Chewbacca did a good job. So, you know, uh, great cast. There, I will say, without spoiling it too much for people who haven't seen it, the, the, there's a female robot that's kind of like Rogue One's version of their kind of sassy robot. And I didn't, I think, I thought that kind of fell flat and was kind of weak, uh, a weak addition to the movie for kind of the comic relief. But uh, overall, you know, everyone else did a good job. To be honest, I, I slightly took offense to that character, just slightly. You know, I had to oh, no, I, to myself and, and, and to release it because I didn't want to, you know, be, be too serious about it. But it did bother me a little bit, just a little bit. No, it did bother me. It bothered me, I wouldn't say a little bit, maybe a little more than a little bit. Uh, it, it just, it was very, yeah, it's very kind of like a caricature, kind of a stereotypical thing. And it just seemed so odd. Um, yeah in the movie. And then there was another like a reveal with kind of the villain, the, the bad, the bad, I guess the bad guys, the other, the other group with the Woody Harrelson scene that seemed, um, 
like it was supposed to be shocking for the wrong reasons, if that makes sense. And you'll probably know what I'm talking yeah. about when, when the yeah. character reveals themselves and you're like, oh, this is, are we supposed to know this? Or is this just because this character is this, that we're supposed to be surprised? So yeah, there was definitely uh, weaknesses in the script. Um, I think Ron Howard, because he, he took over the film halfway through the project and they had to do a lot of reshoots and it is one of the most expensive movies. It's in like the top, I think, 15 of uh, movies ever. Um, yeah. he, he made the best of what he had. And I, one of the things that was amusing to me was um, the Lando character, when he first uh, appears on screen, um, and I know this was nothing but Donald Glover himself, there was an homage paid to Gordon Gartrell. And if you've ever watched The Cosby Show uh, and you were an avid fan of The Cosby Show, then you know who Gordon Gartrell is. And I will leave it at that so when you watch the movie, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Nice. Um, I saw that as well. And um, the next film that I would like to review actually it isn't a film it's a docuseries it's called evil genius and it's now streaming on netflix and it's about uh, a true crime about the murder of brian wells there was a uh, bank heist for pnc bank that happened in erie pennsylvania um in the early 2000s and um the case as it un And they could not figure out who actually robbed the bank or who actually organized the robbing of the bank. Um, there's so many twists and turns and so many players and characters and the backstory of all these characters that are in, involved in this bank heist will blow your mind. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you without telling some of the story about how intricate and interwoven these stories are. It seems like it was made for TV, but it really is real life, and they did an excellent job turning it into a docuseries. Definitely check that out. It's called Evil Genius, and it's now streaming on Netflix. When you watch it, yeah, I've heard, I don't want to stop watching it. <laughs> yeah, I've heard good things about it. It's, it's one of those you get addicted to it, and you really want to find the resolution. And I, I, uh, I'll... Oh, sorry. I'll ask you offline because I, I want to know if you do get the answer at the end, but I don't want you to say it on, on air just in case because that could be a spoiler uh, for some people. But, um, yeah, I do, I do want to find out. Um, uh, well, if I'm we not do kind of... anything. I'll remain silent. Yeah. But I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this. It was this good that I started watching it on a Wednesday. I actually, in my head, real quick, had to make a thought if I wanted to go to work the next day because I was so – entwined into the story. That's how good it is. <sighs> oh, that's a, I feel that just watching like reruns, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Pipeline. Um, well, I oh. think next weekend has a lot of good stuff. Um, and I, I'll mention my top three, which is, you know, uh, surprising because I don't think this weekend had, this past weekend had much, but uh, Ocean's 8, which is, you know, oh, yeah. uh, the the next heist movie. Uh, it's not Steven Soderbergh as the director this time. He did the originals uh, or the you know the remake originals, but that looks good. Hotel Artemis, which um, is kind of like an action sci-fi thriller about this uh, this hotel that's actually like a hospital that runs. Emer it's like a secret emergency room for criminals. So the movie starts off with uh, kind of a heist that probably went wrong, and then Jodie Foster plays the nurse, and they're, they're holed up in this place, and people are attacking them. And it stars uh, Sterling Brown, who I uh, just wanted to mention, he's been doing a lot of good work lately. If you've seen Marshall, he plays uh, the, the convicted criminal. He's in Black Panther as the um, uncle, and um, – he's going to be in the Predator movie and he's been, he's been doing a great work. So I'm glad to see him uh, kind of keeping the momentum going. And the last one on my list is, uh, and this is a limited release right now, but the Mr. Rogers documentary, cause that one looks uh, like a pretty good one as well. They said it's supposed to be good. Yeah. They said it's supposed to be good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
just a quick note about Sterling Brown. Sterling Brown, for me, is turning into one of those actors that I will automatically see whatever he's in because he's he's picking very solid projects to be a part of. He's he's learned early on, or I guess he's learned since he's uh, his star started to shine brighter uh, what projects to really associate himself with, and I'm starting to trust his artistry that way. So anything Sterling Brown is in, I'm buying a ticket. Well, I will. I will let you know. He he is going to be a, a voice in the Angry Birds movie too. So I'm going to hold you to that statement <laughs> and see if you actually hold watch you to that. that. Angry Angry <laughs> Birds did okay. They have a second movie coming out. That's, that's true. Out. That's true. Hey, that's more. That's more. That's more to face than Solo because from the looks of the box office, um, that I don't think they're doing a sequel for that one. Um, it, I don't think that they should. I don't think that they yeah. should. It was fine where it is, and then they can move on. But I do know that they're doing a Lando movie. They are going to follow Lando Calrissian, and they're going to give him a movie, a standalone movie. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm looking out for Mission Impossible Fallout. Mm-hmm. Of course, Venom is still on my radar. And I want to see this new movie called Hereditary. Uh, it's a new horror film coming out. Uh, I definitely want to check that out. Oh yeah, that seems up your that seems up your alley for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, and then down the line, there's also Incredibles too, um, which yes. Uh, yes, you yes, know yes. people love the first one, and then of course Jurassic World, uh, the sequel to or fall it's called Fallen Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, but the sequel to Jurassic World are kind of the other big June releases. All right. Well, listen, guys, as always, thank you for letting us know what to spend our money on and what not to. (laughs) Have a great week, and uh, we'll talk next Monday. All right, sounds good. All right. All right, right back after this. It's Monday morning. You look amazing. I just want to help you to wake up. And start your day off Call me for just Don't have to stress, girl About that mess in your office Cause I know that John at work Been irking you She mad she ain't get that promotion too She mad she don't look as good as you Oh, got a man as good as you do, 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 do Baby, I got, baby, I got you You, you, you And I'll make it easy When you mad at me, I'll make it easy Easy like Sunday morning Even on Monday morning, baby It's Monday morning, you look amazing I just wanna keep you beside me Can you call out, please? I'll make it worth it I'll make it perfect Don't you get dressed, you know what's next <laughs> I promise I'ma take you places you've never been to. Right now, lay there, I'ma stare at you. Cause I ain't never seen something so beautiful. And I wanna take real good care of you. Your man is full of holding your door. 
some shit out the cabin and sending you good morning text when you mad at me. I make it. What are you doing? Hello? I'm so sorry, man. I, I apologize. Okay, well, I apologize. like Sunday morning, Sunday even day. though I'm Monday morning, baby. Welcome back to the Stephen Knight Show. Janera, how's it going? Great. How's everything going with you, Stephen? Can't complain. Can't complain. Glad to be back. We had uh, last week off, so we're back. I know you have some great things for us, I'm sure. I do, I do. And, you know, of course, um, a lot of sales were last week. But right. I was still able to find a couple of things for you guys this week. So yay for me and yay for you guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So Wayfair, if anybody's in the um, in the market for home goods, any type of home goods, they're having a closeout sale. So if you shop there now, you can get up to 80% off of thousands of products um, that are on clearance. Carter's is having a great sale right now on all of their pajamas. And if you shop there now, you can get 60% off of all of their pajamas. Plus, you can get free shipping on your order. Jimboree is also having a sale. And if you shop there now, you can get up to 75% off the entire store. Nine West is also having a sale. And if you shop there, you can get up to 40% off of select, I'm sorry, excuse me, select shoes and handbags. The Gap, if you shop, if you shop there now, you can get up to 50% off of everything. Plus, you can get an extra 20% off of select items. Uh, Express is having a sale, and if you shop there, you can get uh, up to 75% off of your purchase. Neiman Marcus uh, is also having a a great sale, which is just in time for Father's Day because, oh, I have the hiccups. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, Neiman Marcus, last call, is having a sale, Um, and if you shop shop there, you can get an extra 30 to 50% off of your purchase. Old Navy is having a sale, and if you shop there now, you can get uh, 30% off of everything uh, when you shop online or 20% off of everything everything when you shop in the store. And last but not least, J. Crew is having a sale, and if you shop there now, you can get 25% off of select styles. And this is an online-only sale, so you have to use code, code new clothes at checkout. All right. Sounds great. And they can find all this at BudgetShopaholic.com, correct? They surely can. All right. Well, thank you, as always, and have a great week, okay? Okay. You do the same. Okay. And we'll be right back after this. Diamonds. It's true, let's just keep it real I can tell you're hiding, baby What's up with you? Tell me how you feel Cause when it all comes down to it, baby They can't love you like a dog, no Who know it? Now we gotta get past this part Only real love should be in your heart If that's what you want, I got enough to tell Every single day I hear the same thing been drowning in a love that wasn't meant for you And we gotta know that we both messed up a real good thing, baby Yeah, yeah, yeah She in love with diamonds, still ain't nothing behind that I ain't wanna be the one to say it But I gotta tell the truth You roll up and say you wanna be in love But you don't, you don't want it Cause you don't know what to do Saying I'm the perfect man, no, I, no. Still I try to understand how you feel, but you never reciprocate. You just put on your time and you walk away. Just walk away. When it all comes down to it, baby, they can love you like a dog. They can love you like a dog. No, you know it. Now we gotta get past this part. Only real love should be in your heart. If that's what you want, I got enough to tell. Every single day I hear the same thing. Diamonds, still ain't nothing behind that Every single day, I hear the same thing You say you love me, but them diamonds made you change, baby Diamonds made you change, baby Oh, Cause when it all comes down to it, baby They can't love you like a don't know, know it, know it Now we gotta get past this 
this part Only real love should be in your heart If that's what you want, I got enough to tell Every single day I hear the same thing Been drowning in a love that wasn't meant for you You gotta know that we both messed up a real good thing, baby Yeah, yeah, yeah She in love with diamonds, still ain't nothing behind it Yeah, yeah, yeah Welcome back to the Stephen Knight Show. Mr. Cosby, how's it going? Stevie Knight. Hey. How was the Happy weekend? First Monday of June. I know, right? Weekend first. Was good. Mm-hmm. Weekend was good. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yours? Yours? I can't complain. It was it wasn't a lot going on, which was good. I suppose I have a performance, but uh let's just say there was some bad communication and so which I was still other people, they're good and, and from what I understand everything turned out right, but the timing they, that I thought the show was and the timing actually was just didn't work out. So, but anyway, <laughs> and you I was, was going to let 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 me know this when man I could have showed up to your performance. You know, oh I well, I was only doing two songs. I didn't want you to drive way out there for that. A Stevie Knight concert? Come on, man. <laughs> I mean, really? Right. I would have well, been there. Well, good thing you didn't. Time, so. Tell me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Right. Yeah, right. I would have been like, I would have been a little heated. But yeah, right. <laughs> next time, please let I me got know, you. man. I like, I'm, uh, I'm supporting you always. I'm always yeah. to support Stevie. Yeah. Stevie K. You came, I remember when I first started performing in Atlanta back in 2007. You came. Remember that? <laughs> I do. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you came yeah. like twice, I think. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. Fun time. Fun yeah. time. So I can only imagine now. Oh yeah, it's a lot better now. That, that you have, you know, right, right. Yeah. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But yeah, let me know, please, the next. Time I got that, you. Most. All right, appreciate it. All right. Definitely. So sports. All right. So I mean, come on. What's what? What is the talk of the of the sports world right now? NBA, NBA finals. finals. Yeah. NBA finals. NBA finals. Um, Golden State Warriors, two games up against yep. the Cleveland Cavaliers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I I watch um, both games. I watch both games, and it just seems like, you know, someone did a a, a meme, and it had LeBron going against several of the Golden State Warriors, and uh, yeah. J.R. Smith behind him, kind of helping the <laughs> helping the uh, the Warriors. The Warriors. He's like he's yeah. fighting everyone by himself. Yeah. yeah. Um. That that game won was. Um, that was crazy. Well, they could, they could have won that. It was crazy. I mean, they could have, but they could have also. I mean, well, they did lose, but I, I'm, I'm kind of torn with it. Like, I get okay, J.R. Smith. Yes, that was a horrible play that right. he, or lack lack thereof. I, I, I wouldn't even call that a play. I would just call right. that a, a, a lapse in, lapse in judgment. Yeah. Um, but. That didn't, that didn't lose still, the game. <laughs> right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if um, – I, I believe it was George Hill who was fouled. If George Hill would have made that second foul. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then yep. they would have had a one-point lead. And, yeah. Uh, but who's to say – but who's to say that the Warriors – because it was like five five seconds left in the game. You know, I mean, come on, Steph Curry's making – Oh, yeah. Half-court threes. Yeah. So, Yeah. I mean, n- nothing but net three. So mm-hmm. who's to say that the Warriors would have probably still, you know, they would have won the game or at right. least they would have won the game with a shot or probably would have maybe gotten fouled or something in, um, in a one 
with the foul shot. So people saying that Cleveland would have won if he wouldn't have did that, I I don't believe that. I don't believe yeah, that. Yeah, you can't really determine it that way. You can't determine it that way. They, right. They, now, now, people can also argue, LeBron, why would you pass the ball to um, George Hill in the last seconds of the game? Who got fouled? But still, people are saying, Brian, you know, a minute left in the game, 30 seconds left in the game, 10, 10, 10, 10 seconds in the game, you should be having the ball. You right. should be taking the shot. You should put yourself in position to win the game. That's what Michael Jordan did. That's what all mm-hmm. of the, you know, great, great, greats, you know, do. And so people are, are a little, you know, going back to that, you know, is he better than Jordan? And people are oh, saying, yeah. no, because Jordan – Jordan wouldn't have done that. Jordan would have made, would have taken the shot. He wouldn't have passed on the shot. Well, you know, I give Ron credit. I like the fact that he passed because he trusts his teammates. But I feel that at at times he's he's passing his, passing to his teammates a little too much, especially in that situation. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like okay, it's almost like he's trying to do it so that people don't talk about him not being a it, team player. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Col- Kobe Bryant, uh, he he, I can't find it, but he he did a statement because everybody's been comparing those three and uh, him, right. Jordan, and and he said we can all be great. You don't have to compare us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We can all be great. Thank you. you don't have to compare us. There's room for more than one, right? Yes, right. we're all we all did our thing. Yeah, yeah. I agree exactly, with that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And actually, if you think about it. LeBron and Jordan and Kobe, well, Kobe and Jordan were both shooting guards. Bron is a hybrid. I guess he's a, he, yeah. he he's a small forward, but he can play. You know, two. He can play th- four. I mean, exactly. he can play so many positions. Um, Jordan wasn't that. Jordan c- could not play all five positions. Neither could Kobe. LeBron in any situation in the game when it's needed. He can play all five. Yeah. Positions. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, but yeah, they're, anyway, it's, it is what it is. They're all great. They're all in the top five greatest players of all time period. Hands down. Exactly. LeBron is a, is a top five player, mm-hmm. whether you hate him or whether you don't, I actually love this man's game. I yeah. have so much yeah. love for He's a LeBron beast. James's game. He mm-hmm. is a beast. He is such a like he is gifted. This man is just talented, gifted individual when it comes to playing basketball. It's yeah. amazing. All right. Yeah. With that with that being said also, just like the Warriors won the first two games at home, which is what they were supposed to have done. Right. Cleveland Cleveland can win their games at home. People but people are predicting that they're gonna win it. They're gonna win. Who, Cleveland? Yeah. The next game three. They're gonna win. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. If Cleveland, if Cleveland, if 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 Cleveland loses Game Three, then it's a wrap. This series is done. Oh it's yeah, it's done. They cannot win four games in a row. Mm-hmm. It, it's just not going. It's not going. So they they have to win Game Three, and I and I believe that they are going to win Game. Yeah, three. me too. I do, I do, I do, I do. So this is not going to be a sweep. I don't mm-hmm. see it being a sweep at all. Game Two was. It was pretty ugly. It was ugly. That was ugly. It was, yeah, it was. It was, it was Especially ugly. towards the end. I, yeah, I was disappointed. I, 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 I was, but Steph Curry was just. I mean, he was like. I oh, mean, yeah. Steph. When he's in his zone, that's yeah, hard. It's hard. It's hard to stop him. You know what I mean? It, it's like watching a kid at the basketball court on the playground. Just I, throwing it just up. Like this little. He just mm-hmm. throwing it. Up. I mean, shots, shots yep. that you're like, come on, really, dude, really. And then really. net. Nothing but net. <laughs> and, and nothing but net. It's not like it wasn't banked in. It didn't touch no. the rim and bouncing. Mm-hmm. I mean, nothing but net. And it's almost like, is he even looking at the rim when he just throws it? Exactly. Yeah. Again, he's another guy who, who is just gifted. He's just talented, gifted, mm-hmm. and a hard worker. Yeah. Curry is, is a hard worker. And we'll he's take it in. physically gifted. Right. He's not physically gifted like LeBron James. Right, is. right. This man has always been undervalued, underestimated, and margin marginalized and mm-hmm. undersized. Yeah, but he just works hard. He works his off. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm cussing out, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah. Steph, brother, 
again, I love watching his game too because when he's on, he is on. It's beautiful to watch. It's, Most definitely. Yeah, it's all that. Mm-hmm. All that. Yeah. So yeah. we'll see. Game three, we'll see what happens. I got the Cavs winning, which probably means that the Warriors will win. So sorry, Cavs. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Cavs. All right. All right. All right. One last thing. Hockey tonight is game three. Um, Vegas, Washington. Game three has now it's the uh, series has shifted back to the East Coast to DC. It's um, tied up at one game apiece, and I mean this is Washington's time to really shine, man. If like if they can win these these home games, they have a chance of um, winning the Stanley Cup. So yeah, yeah. Go Caps. We'll see what happens. You know. So uh, I, mm, I'm, hey. I'm, I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm not a big hockey fan, but this this playoff, this Stanley Cup um, um, season, postseason has has been fun to watch. And actually, I kind of got back into hockey last last year during the um, playoffs when Nashville had that great run to the um, mm-hmm. Stanley Cup Finals. Yeah, and they lost to um, Pittsburgh, but still, it was it, it was just fun seeing this just know, watch like a small yeah. market team from the south. Mm-hmm. You know, a a team that people really didn't even think was even going to make it as far as they made it, and they did. And it was just you know, it, I'm all about the underdog and and a great team game. I love yeah. watching great teams. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, so what about you, Miss Knight? Have you been watching the um, Stanley Cup Finals at all? Yeah. I have not. No. <laughs> Do you know what 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 the Stanley Cup is? Do you know what it's about? Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, I've heard of Stanley Cup. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sorry. I'm just making. <laughs> My bad. Okay. Right. Yeah, you know. Okay. All right. I'm 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 gonna leave it at, at that. I'm okay. Gonna... Okay. Uh, Y'all gonna. Go ahead, go ahead. What What are your thoughts on uh, Serena Williams dropping out? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, before I answer that question, do Do you know why she had to um, drop out? Yeah, she got injured. She said, and she said that she wasn't. If she wasn't at, she always said she wasn't fifty or sixty percent playing wise, like from an injury that she would. Uh, okay. She told her doctors that she would go home. Do you know what injury that it was? I'm just asking. I. I do, but I'm not I sure. read about it. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But I know she said something. She felt Pec- something in her chest or something. Pec- like in the yeah, third her, yeah, yeah. Pec- pectoral muscle. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And so she she has said that she physically feels fine, but that what it is is that when she tries to serve, mm-hmm. then it hurts. And yeah. so, of course, in tennis, if if you can't serve, then you know you, that's pretty much it. Right. you got to be able to. To serve, so she could um, sw- um, swing the um, the um, tennis racket fine. You know, once once the ball's in play, then you know she can she can do that fine. But you know, whenever it's whenever she initially has to serve the um, ball, she she was yeah, insane. Yeah, and, yeah. And she is known her and her sister Venus are known for having that powerful, if not the the fastest, mm. most powerful serves in history. So that's that's part that's part of what makes her, you know, like really just function as a top athlete in the world is her serve. And so mm-hmm. when her serve's not on then it's it's at a at, at a disadvantage to her. So yeah. I definitely understand her, you know, taking time out. And I, I kinda think so I'm, I'm like, you know, Serena, just kinda rest a little bit, you know. If if she's ready for when 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 Wimbledon, then fine. Mm-hmm. If not, then you rest for that. Show up at the um, U.S. Open. Well, you know, people were mad. Like she's getting a lot of backlash online because she was winning. <laughs> so haters. haters. They were hating. Haters. They were hating. Just ignorant. Just ignorant. Just ignorant. You know, just stupid. Just stupid. And but she, I kind of get it though because if you win all all, all the time, it's like people kind of you know they kind of hate him. But well, they were talented. They were also saying, you know, she, she the big match. What people were saying was her rival, which really isn't a rival because. Um, Maria Sharp Sharpapova. Not right? a rival. That is not a right. rival. They say for 14 right. years Serena's been winning. <laughs> so why is the car right, a rival? Right. That's she said she only won one time <laughs> back in the day. That's that's not a rivalry. That's yeah. not a rivalry. Yeah. Hey, hey, um, 
a rivalry would be back and forth and winning. Then, yeah. Yeah, like you mm-hmm. know, like I guess you could say back in the eighties, Boston Celtics. Right, Lakers, Lakers right. Bird, uh-huh. Magic. Yep. A rivalry cost. They both were winning, you know, every every other year. Mm-hmm. When you win in ninety plus percent of the time, not ninety five percent of the time. All right, that's not a rivalry. rivalry. Uh uh-uh, uh, not at all. Not a rivalry. But that's the media. They wanna you know and and it goes beyond just tennis. It's politics, it's oh yeah. Race. It's you know it's race it's 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 a lot that has to deal with that. But mm-hmm. people people if you hear me and Stephen talking, that is not a rivalry. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It is, you know. Yeah. It's not. It's not. Anyway, it's called domination. Yeah. Not a rivalry. Exactly. So anyway, so what else, brother? Anything else that's on your mind? I talking? think that's it. Those are the main what? things that I want to discuss. Yeah. What about you? Ah. Uh, Oh yeah, football. Did, did we talk about the um, the 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 uh, situation with the um, national anthem and all that? I think that we did. Oh uh, no, I, no, we didn't because we were we were out. We didn't. Oh, oh yeah, about we the um, out. Yeah. the uh, finding the finding. If they need, yeah, about yeah. The finding, yeah, if um, mm-hmm. they need, yeah. You know what? What do you think about that? Should well, they just stay in in the locker room? Should they come well, out and still kneel? And- I love I love the fact that. Several of the um, coaches have said that they'll pay the fine if they're um, because what because what they said essentially is that the league will find the team, you know, if if someone um, and then and then the the team decides how they're going to handle the disciplinary action for their for right. the player, but um, but some of the teams are saying that we'll pay the fine, we'll pay the fine, it's fine, right. you know, right. that's their freedom right. of freedom of speech, you know, and Absolutely. um yeah. and. I posted something on Instagram the other day. It had a picture of um, a slave on the, you know, kneeling, and the um, the uh, slave owner with the whip saying "Get up." Then it had a picture mm-hmm. of um, the bl- a black gentleman during the civil rights era sitting at the um, at the bar, and them saying "Get up." And then now you have uh, players on their knees yeah, during the flag yeah. and they're saying get up. Um I think I think it, it is it's it is it's taking away the First Amendment. You know what I mean? I mean right. they're not being disruptive. They're not being disrespectful. Right. They've explained over and over and over again. I think what it's gonna take is these players that are pro kneeling to mm-hmm. to do what Colin Kaepernick did. Risk it all because they're not going to fire everyone. Right. They can't fire everyone. Right. You know what I mean? They, they can't. They can't yeah. fire everyone. So there's there's always been power and no- numbers. And until people unify in that way, you know, I think that we're going to continue to see stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I I find this mm-hmm. argument that I've that I've seen on social media saying that um, that they should they they should not kneel. They should, you know, respect the flag because it's what their em- employers want them to do. You know, if you're at a job, then then you have to do what the employer says. My thing is this. I don't know any other job where I have to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, then. Do, do, uh, do, well, hold on, hold on. Do, do you have to do that at no. nine, 9 to 5? Not at all. Exactly. I don't have to do that at, at at mine. And I guarantee you that the vast majority of those people that are hating on on these football players that are on social media that that, that are saying that they don't have to stand for the for the national anthem at their job. Well, there so, there is a, a DJ out here, a radio DJ out here in Atlanta named Katie Bo, and he made a great point. He said. If you want everyone, you want us, they want them to kneel for, the, uh, I mean, to stand for the uh, national anthem, you need to have the concession stand stop. You have people stop yep. walking during thing. You need to yep. stop everything. Yep. Everything needs to stop and everyone focus mm-hmm. on that flag and, and you know, pledge that's to right. the flag. That's if, if, if that's I, how it's going to be. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Shut it. Yeah. Just stop in your place. That's right. We cannot serve during uh-huh. 10 minutes or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And right. see how. And see how long they'll um they'll 
they'll be all, you know, ang- exactly. angry about it. I guarantee you that's, that's, that's a great point. You yeah, know, I agree. A great point. That's a great point. And, and then one last thing, this actually is something that, 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 that came about recently. This has not been going on in with the NFL for decades and decades. This is mm-hmm. something that, that I believe have that, that, that came about maybe within the last 10 years or so, like right. pretty 10, 15 years, if that, you know, mm-hmm. so, yeah, this is this is pretty 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 new. So yeah, th- there's no yeah. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, we'll see. Football season coming up is is going to be interesting. It's gonna yeah, be it will be interesting. I wonder what the numbers look like. I wonder what the numbers look like. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. All right. Well, yo, y'all can follow me if if you want to. I hope that you do. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, first name last name. All right, Mr. Knight. Salute All right, you, everyone. Have a great week, okay? You too. Okay. We'll be right back after this.
This is Savage. And this is Ty. And we are from the Articulate Podcast, and you are listening to the Stephen Knight Show. Listen, that's our show. Shout out to Nadami. Again, her EP is called Air Castle. And also Ralph A. Celestin and Mia Mendez. The film is Boston to Philly. It'll be available uh, June 6th. So check it out uh, on Apple. Apple, uh, not Apple, Amazon. <laughs> Amazon Prime. Listen, have a great week. And uh, talk to you again next Monday. Good night. Tonight is all eyes on me. Everything's gonna be all right.